so October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and it's now May, so that's a long time. But it's been a great river. Yet another brilliant East Coast river. So entertaining. You've got the Butley, you've got the Ald, you've got the Ore. It's three rivers, really, and I understand now. When I came here, I thought, well, why, why are they differentiating between the Ore and the Ald? But they are such different rivers. Just catching the last of the ebb down the oar, and then I'm gonna go out of the bar here at low tide. No problems. A, a boat with a big keel wouldn't do it, but I can do it. And then <laughs> I'm gonna sneak along the coast. I guess mostly motoring against the tide up to Southwold. It's not far, it's um, the old sat nav says about 15 miles. I'm sad to be leaving the three rivers, but there's a lot to look forward to. My initial plan was to attempt to cut the corner of the ore shingle. I'd been down to explore the bar several times at low water and knew it quite well. By the time I got there, the tide had turned and it was really powering in through the gap I was aiming for. I was thinking of cutting the corner, but I'm not now. So I chickened out and decided to take the long way round. Then I changed my mind again and had a go at the corner. It was a struggle as the beast ran at full blat against the incoming tide cutting through the shallows. Occasionally a pretty big four or five foot standing wave would appear out of nowhere and I was worried about the slug grounding. Only about three feet of Eight water feet. under the keels. I'm sure I can make it through here. You can see where the blast of the current comes. And I've seen this at low tide so I know that there's water here. The only trouble is that where there's water uh, the tide is running at its fastest, barreling around this corner here. No, I'm losing. I'm still losing. Occasionally I win. Four foot seven. I'm afraid she's beaten me. Or has she? No, I am kind of winning. I think I'm winning. I think I'm winning. Four foot five. You can see where the deeper water is. If I can cut around here, I've saved myself a huge amount of time. Four foot five. Yes, yes, I've won. <laughs> I've won, I hope. It's getting deeper now, which is good. If I can get some depth underneath me. It was a real struggle to get around that headland, uh, to get going through the water, but now I've done it, I've saved myself about a um, mile and a half or something. All I need to do now is to get some depth underneath me. Five feet, okay, we're home and dry. Brilliant. Six feet. Fifteen foot, now we're fine. Okay, so now it's going to get really boring. I can um, take the hatch out. I'd even put my waterproofs on, right down to the, not the boots, but everything else. It took me 12 minutes to do less than 400 yards, and the beast was going at full throttle, which isn't very good for it. Never did understand, fisherman. 
the wind right on the nose, lots of swell, tied against me, it could have been hell, but the skies were fantastic. I had asked the locals about hugging the 15 or 20 foot contour along this coast and they'd all told me that it was completely clear of obstacles all the way to Southwold. And the coast has plenty to offer by way of entertainment. I knew this strip of land well because I'd spent the winter exploring it from the other side. This was the first time I'd seen the other face of Alborough, the way the fishermen perceive it. And Alborough is quite twee when viewed from the sea. There's something odd with this sort of boat voyaging. I always find it easier to fall in love with a town if I first see it from the water. Malden or Rowhedge, the first I saw of them was from their estuaries. Walton too. That's bound to shape your view of them. Well, it does with me, that's for sure. During the journey, I've become a bit of a connoisseur of power station architecture. This is Sizewell. The big grey blockhouse is the old British-designed Magnox reactor built in the 1960s and is the same age as the slug, but it cost about £60 million. Don't know if you know how a Magnox nuclear power station works, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Nuclear fuel comes in rods. If you put the rods close together, they start to get hot, really hot. Stick graphite between the rods and they cool down. So far, pretty simple. In the Magnox, the fuel weighs 300 tonnes, and moving 300 tonnes of hot stuff around is far from simple. In the old Magnox station, they use carbon dioxide to move the heat from the nuclear core to a steam boiler. The CO2 is running at 20 atmospheres and at stupidly high temperatures. The gas is blown around the system by fans that are connected to electric motors. The drive shafts for the fans pass through the walls of the pressure vessel. Think about those bearings and be amazed. The CO2 is then used to heat water to create steam to drive the turbines that drives the generators that create some of the power being used in your computer. So this big engineering is inside a 20 atmosphere pressure vessel which is 19 metres across. That's the length of three slugs. Nuclear power stations are expensive because they're high-end engineering. No two Magnoxes are the same because they were built by British engineers with a compulsion to tweak things but a Magnox is designed so that it doesn't need to be shut down for refuelling. The old one here ran for 50 years, but is now being decommissioned. £60 million to build, and the bill for decommissioning is going to be £1.2 billion. Size well B, under the dome, is a whoopy doop pressurised water reactor made to an American design that involves superheated water running at 350 degrees C and at a pressure of 150 atmospheres. How you would engineer such a thing is utterly beyond my comprehension. But PWRs can be built quite small, so they're used in nuclear ships and submarines. Sizewell B should run for another 50 years or so. It does need shutting down every couple of years for refuelling, and then they do some maintenance. And that, to me, as an engineer, seems like a good thing, because every machine I've ever come across needs to be shut down for maintenance. There is going to be a size well C, a French one this time. I'm sure it'll be absolutely fine. The power stations are constructed on 8 foot thick concrete pads. These have been laid down on the 200 foot deep bed of sand and shingle that is East Anglia and will one day again become the North Sea. It's the same stuff that's being washed out of here and is accumulating on the Ness, so one day, one way or another, Sizewell will arrive at Orford. One more thing about the UK, it's tilting on its axis. East Anglia is sinking, and has been since the last Ice Age. So there you have it, Sizewell, yet another brilliant place to build a nuclear power station, or three. Of course, if the scientists who chose the site knew their history, there's a great lesson for them just a few miles up the coast at Dunwich. A thousand years ago, this was Britain's third largest town. 3,000 people, eight churches and the biggest port in the east. Now all utterly swallowed up by the North Sea. All that remains is a single pub, a line of houses and a museum with one of the most unstoppably enthusiastic curators I've ever encountered. It closed that harbour, that got narrow.
narrower and narrower, and then it got washed across in 1286 in huge storms, and they weren't really able to dredge. They tried to dredge it by, but they couldn't ever get the deep berth for the ships, no, and no. it closed up completely about 20 years later, and they weren't able to open yeah, it. I was going to say, which river was it? But of course, it was the Blythe, wasn't it? Originally? Well, the, the Blythe goes, the, it, it joins actually, so the Blythe goes straight inland, and this is the Dunnish River, which is a small little which sort of cross over the bridge. And now that I know about Dunwich and Sizewell, it's weird to think that maybe in a thousand years' time some slightly radioactive Londoner might sail his slightly radioactive boat right across the top of what was once three nuclear power stations. Then we come to Southwold, which is engaged in a constant battle with the North Sea in an attempt to stop the inexorable forces of nature. Longshore Drift is trying to close the harbour entrance. You can see the shingle piling up to the north. The inhabitants of Southwold have reason to fear because 700 years ago the River Blythe exited at Dunwich in a fine, well-sheltered, all-tide port. And look what happened to them. In fact, here at Southwold, nature is already winning. What used to be the main fish dock has been condemned. It's concrete over gravel and is ready to fall into the river at a moment's notice. So you're not allowed to tie up there. After the defunct dock, the next thing you notice about Southwold are the scores of black painted wooden clinker built fishermen's huts. And the local fishermen still favour the 18 or 20 foot clinker hulls they've been using here for hundreds of years. 120 beach boats once worked out of Southwold. Not anymore though. The other thing you notice is that there are lots of classic boats here. Even the mobos are wood or steel. There are also some expensive yachts, very expensive yachts. So Southwold has both taste and money. Sadly though, there's an ugly cluster of white planing abominations, complete with synthetic flowers in their flapping plastic clad conservatories. There's one other small boat visitor, a Corriby on passage, but he was gone the next morning before I could talk to him. Ashore, the huts are even more insane. Each one belonged to a fishing boat crew. A plot costs about £3,000 if you can get one. No sleeping in them is allowed. The whole lot are prone to flooding. In '53, they all got washed away. And the pub reveals how high the tide came in that year. And the harbour people are ready for it to happen again. Then there are the stout wooden clinker built 20 footers scattered around the place, reminiscent of the 120 spratting boats that worked off the Southwold beach a hundred years ago. So I found a man working on one and asked him what's so great about heavy wooden clinker boats. It turns out that they grip the water better than a slick, lightweight plastic hull of the same length. Well, the weight, probably weight ratio is also... You mean it's heavier? A heavier boat. Yeah. Uh, it's also more stable in the water. Why is it more stable in the water? Because of the sheer weight of the boat, I think, design in the clinker itself. The clinker helps? Oh yes, the clinker helps, definitely. But, 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 but what about a plastic clinker? Is that as, as good as a...? Well, I don't think they're, so, they're so stable. They aren't so heavy in the water. They don't, so couldn't you just make a plastic clinker boat and put more, well, more can, weight in it? Can, well, you can ballast and put more ballast in them, obviously, to, to, um, to give you the weight. But they, they, they don't tow. You know, you can't tow a trawl net as, as efficiently or you know with the same sort of power um, with a with a plastic boat how long have you had this uh 15 16 years and, and where was it built uh everson's in uh, woodbridge in the 60s you said in the 60s 68 yes so will it last another 40 years do you think well with the proper care and attention, I would say, yes. <laughs> so if it stayed in your hands, would it last another well, 40 I'd years like or not? Think, uh, I won't be living the 40 years to, 
to keep it up, up to scratch, but uh, I'd like to think that it would be kept up. So how, to... how often do you go out in the winter? Well, not weather permitting, obviously, it's all related to the weather. And it's yeah. The sides of boat like this, you know, you, uh, you can't... Um... No, you can't take any risks. No, no. And that's the Triumph Herald back axle. Triumph, Herald, Herald, Herald. So my next small yacht will be synthetic clinker and heavily built, but I won't be bothering with the Triumph Herald disc.